Good morning. Just a reminder, we do have a challenge. First, wear something purple. Bring someone with you. Take a picture with two friends. Attend at least three meetings, which tonight is the third night. And learn one scripture, which it should be like. Um, we also will only remind you guys for any kids, we have little uh, pamphlets and books back there in the right-hand side, or the left-hand side of the room, if anyone wanna keep the kids busy. And thank you guys again, and happy Sabbath. Yeah, I feel like, you know, our church is very multicultural, isn't it, Marcus? Yes. And I feel like one of the things that culture has brought to our church is island time. Does anyone know what island time is? No, nobody knows what island time is? I see some smiling. Some people know what island time is. <laughs> It means that typically, you know, things start at 6.30, people typically come 6.45, you know, 7, you know, so it'll start to fill up, but we're, we're slowly bringing people towards punctuality, Amen. one meeting at a time, right? <laughs> there we go. Definitely. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and have open prayers. Everybody right bow your heads here. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the opportunity for us to come into your house of worship, to um, fellowship with others. And most importantly, to learn about you, Lord. Please um, give us an open mind, open hearts, uh, and help us as we open your word um, to focus on the truth and the message. And we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, so now we'll have a praise team up. Yes. Happy Sabbath, guys. 
I just had to ask if it was Friday night. This is how discombobulated I am, but I'm happy it's the Sabbath and we are here together to worship. We are going to worship. We're getting there. Amen. It's a day of rest. We can slowly take our time, right? Yes. God's not in a rush. I wish he wasn't in, in more of a rush sometimes to come get us, but that's what our, our sermon's about tonight, right? Dear Lord, thank you for the Sabbath day. Thank you for bringing us here together, uh, that we're able to come and we're worshiping in the space, that we can be with all these different people, different walks of life, and still be one in you and all children together. In your kingdom, as we learn more about your coming, and hopefully you're coming soon and very soon, let us just be encouraged and ready and waiting and willing to spread this word out from tonight. Let us learn so we can bring the message not just to ourselves, but to all those that we come in contact with who might not know you as well as we do. So Lord, thank you for this, this time together and this worship we're going to have. Um, and thank you so much for the Sabbath. Amen. Father God, we come together as we have prayed for many things tonight for our spiritual growth. We pray, uh, we have prayed for our finances. We have prayed for um, our dreams and our plans. And we have prayed for, I can't think of the other one. And I just ask that you be with each one of those areas in each one of our lives. Each one of us tonight has a prayer request that's unspoken. And I just ask that you be with each one of uh, the families represented and the issues that are there and the hurts that are on our hearts and the happiness that is on our hearts too. Thank you that we're here tonight. And may you bless our time together. May you bless our speaker. And may we learn more about you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, everyone, please find your seats. We're going to proceed with our uh, praise and worship time, just like Jacob introduced. Raise your hand if you've been here, uh, you know, one night before. Maybe yesterday or maybe Wednesday. Raise your hand if you've been here before, okay? So we just want to say, may the Lord continue to bless you. And if you were here before, raise your hand if you were blessed <laughs> before already, okay? Now, good job, guys. Raise your hand if this is your first night with us today. So we have some newcomers. May the Lord be with you. We're going to sing a song that I have encouraged people just to call this their prayer through the rest of this program. It is entitled, He Will Hold Me Fast. And it is a beautiful song that speaks on how Jesus is able to take you in his hands and provide anything that you may need. So let us all sing together, He Will Hold Me Fast, is the pink song that is back there in the system. We all sing together, okay? Now, yes. Let's all sing together. When I fear, my faith will fail. When, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tender would prevail, He will hold me fast. I can never keep my hold through life's fearful past, for my love is so. sing together, okay?
about those times when you do not know what to do and you feel like something's wrong, may this be your prayer. Christ, please hold me fast. Amen? Amen. Now we're going to move on. We're going to sing together. We have this hope. We have this hope that burns within our God. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ Amen. We do have a blessed hope. Can we all stand? Let us sing together our theme song. Hopefully, technology will help us this time. It is entitled, Even So Come. So hopefully, you're able to join us. Jesus. 
at this moment in time, I'm going to do scripture reading. It's very long. <laughs> We're looking at Luke chapter 17, verse 32. Yes, we can be seated. <laughs> Again, that's Luke chapter 17, verse 32. And the verse go, remembers Lot's wife. Short and sweet. <laughs> Remember that. That's one of the challenges. Remember one scripture. That should be easy. At this time, call up Mr. Robert Menice. Can you hear me now? There we go. Happy Sabbath to everybody. Again, such a pleasure and an honor for me to be here in this beautiful church, beautiful people. And um, I want to thank uh, Pastor Eddie and the team and just everybody that I've met and haven't met again. I thank you for your hospitality and I appreciate you greatly. So, before we begin, if we can get the, uh, the slides up and, um, and the clicker, and uh, I'd like to pray one last time as they try to get that situated. Father God in heaven, Lord, we are here again tonight. Lord, we are now in sacred hours. And Lord... As we've been studying your word, dear God, we have come to the conclusion that there are no and, if, or buts about it. Jesus is coming. As he promised and as prophecy reveals. But Lord, we're going to see tonight that you want us to be ready. And Lord, I can't say it enough, and I thank you that you are doing everything you can to see us in eternity. Amen. And we thank you that salvation is a free gift Amen. through Christ. Amen. So Lord, again, we ask for your Holy Spirit, and because we ask in the name of Jesus, Jesus said, ask anything in my name and it shall be given. And Lord... We know that this prayer request, the Holy Spirit be poured out tonight, is according to your will. You want to answer that. You will answer that, Lord. And therefore, again, I pray our hearts are open to receive it. It would not do us well to be here with hardened hearts, Lord. May we open our hearts for the Spirit to convict us and guide us, even to make decisions. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so, as I said, first of all, if you've missed any of the presentations, you can go to the Panama City Seventh-day Adventist Church Facebook page, and you can view the first two. And we saw in night uh, one on Wednesday that Daniel 2 makes it crystal clear again that Jesus is coming. There are no and, if, or buts about it. It is as sure as you are breathing. And again, I'm going to ask tonight, who here is breathing tonight? If you're alive and breathing, it is as sure as Christ is to return. Then we saw last night what it really, the Bible really teaches in regards to how Christ will return. We talked about what the Bible truly teaches in regards to one taken and one left and how that applies to the second coming of Jesus. But the thing is, you can know intellectually that God is real and that this is God's word. You can know intellectually that Christ is going to return. You can know many things here. But the most important thing, yes, is to know because knowing helps us prepare. But the heart is the name of the game. The battle is for the mind, the heart. God wants to see you in eternity, and the enemy wants to see you lost. Amen. And there is a battle out there, and, God, and Satan works through deception and lies, and God works through truth and love to, to guide and lead us into that. Wonderful. And tonight, we set the stage, lights one and two, tonight, 
we're going to look at a story that Jesus told us in Luke chapter 17, when he begins to parallel, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Yes or no? Yes. But in Luke's account, he says, as it was in the days of Lot. Did he not? And as Marcus said, this is, if not the most easiest scripture reading to remember, Jesus says in just three words, some of the most important words we could understand. And these words are very solemn, and these are the words. Now, you just say that with me. Remember Lot's wife. Those three words are solemn words because you and I all know what happened to Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? She turned into a pillar of salt. Yes or no? Now, is the word remember defined as to bring to mind or think of again, to keep in mind or for attention or consideration. And my question is, does Jesus only want us to remember that Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt? I mean, is that all that matters? Is that what he wants to say? J j just remember that she became a pillar of salt. Is that all he wants us to remember? Yes or no? He wants us to remember why? What's, what's the word? Why? Why did she turn into a pillar of salt? This is a appeal by God for God's people to never forget what happened to her. May it never happen to us. Because in the last days, listen now, not only will the world be like the days of Noah and Lot, can you say amen? But also, the, the hearts of many will also be as it was in the days of Noah and Lot. Yes? And today, we are going to look at and study Lot's wife and the appeal God is making for us tonight. Are you ready? Are you ready? I hope so. So for our good, God wants us to remember this story because God loves us and wants us to be in eternity. What happened to Lot's wife was not God's will or desire. You should say amen. The will of God was not for Lot's wife to turn into a pillar of salt. He wanted to save her as well as all of those in Sodom. Can you say amen? And we're going to see today, and when you study the Bible, always you should see that God's love is always magnified here. We're going to study tonight also that God did everything he can to save the people of Sodom. Just like he's doing everything he can to save everyone in the last days. Because God desires all to be saved, but not all will be saved because we have a choice to make. Amen. Are you with me? We're going to see it was her desire and condition of her heart, though God did all he could to save her, the people of Sodom and others. If you have your Bible, go to Genesis chapter 13. Let's begin to study. As Jesus let us know, as also was, well, it was in the days of Lot. And then he says, remember Lot's wife. Let's see who can beat me to Genesis 13. Impossible, impossible. I gave you plenty of time. That's, that's. Say amen if you're there. So let's get the context of the story. Lot comes with his uncle. Who's his uncle? Abram. Okay. And just for the sake of argument, we'll call him Abraham because that's what he became known as. Yes? So he comes with his uncle Abram or Abraham on his journey to Canaan. 
It comes to a point where both families are growing exponentially with animals and their families, and Lot and Abram, or Abraham, have to make a choice. And we are in Genesis chapter 13, and let's pick up the story here in verse 5. Let me know if you're there. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them that they not might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell, what's the next word? Together. Verse 8. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the what? The left, then I will go, I will go right. Or if you take the, I will go. Can you say amen for Abraham? Amen. As the eldest, Lot should have submitted to him. As the uncle. But Abram shows his humility here and says, you know what? I'm going to put my position aside and I'll give you the decision to make. And now, what verse are we on? Should I start over? Ten, thank you. And Lot, <laughs> and Lot, like, no, don't start over. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go uh, towards Zoar, verse 11. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other, verse 12. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Now, don't miss it. He went from pitching his tents near Sodom to Sodom. He pitched his tent at first in the plains of Sodom, but eventually he ended up in Sodom. Are you with me? Now, listen to me. And this decision... This decision that Lot would make to not only pitch his tent near Sodom and eventually into Sodom would be a, a, a decision that would eventually have severe and dire consequences. I would even have to say catastrophic consequences. Lot's decision to eventually go into Sodom with his family and live would eventually have catastrophic consequences. So what grabbed Lot's eyes to Sodom? Now, I want to read a little bit here from the book, Patriarchs and Prophets. It says, here was the home of the palm tree, the olive, the vine, the flowers shed their fragrance throughout the year. Rich harvest clothed the fields and flocks and herds covered the encircling hills. Art and commerce contributed to enrich the proud city of the plain. The treasures of the east adorned her places. And the caravans of the desert brought their stones of precious things to supply her marts of trade. With little thought or labor... Every want of life could be supplied, and the whole year seemed as one round of festivities. This was the place to be. This was the place that everybody wanted to be at. The party never went down. It was rich. It was luxurious. It was a happening city, and it began to catch up. Lot's eye and his family's eyes, and eventually they were in there, and let's begin to see what began to happen. We're in chapter 18 now. Go to chapter 18. We are going to get to the part where Jesus appeals to us to remember, but we're setting the stage and studying what happened here. Are you in chapter 18? In chapter 18, Abram receives how many visitors? Speak to me, friends. Three. Two were angels. One was God himself. Yes? Yes. And we're in chapter 18. And 
God reveals to Abraham that the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah have reached their limits. Their sins have reached to heaven. We're in verse 20. We're in verse 20. Say amen if you're there. And the Lord said, because the outcry of, against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because there is sin, their sin is very grave. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it. That has come to me, and if not, I will know. Verse 22. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before whom? The Lord. And Abraham came near and said, would, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place not, and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? 25, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked, far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within that city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Amen. Continues. Verse 20. Seven. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now I am who but dust and ashes have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Verse 28. Suppose there were five less than 50. What's five less than 50? It's 45. Would, be, would you destroy all the city for the lack of five? So he said, If I find there 45, I will not destroy it. Verse 29. And he said, And he spoke to him and said again, Suppose there should be. 40 found there. God said, I will not destroy it. Verse 30. And he said, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak support. There were 30 should they be found there. And we know the story. And he said, well, Lord, I mean, hey, let, let, let's, let, 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 let's say 20. And God says, hey, you know, if I find 20 righteous in that city, I will spare it. And, and Abraham says, Lord, Lord, I, you know, have mercy, please. But let's say you find 10. And what does God say? If I find 10 righteous, I will not destroy the city. Now, we're gonna, why did Abraham stop at 10? We're going to answer that question in a minute. Why not go down lower? He stops at 10, and I believe there's a good reason for that. And God says, I will not destroy Sodom if it reaches 10. Can you say amen? Now, listen. We see here a look of God's mercy, long-suffering, and compassion revealing to Abraham the situation, look at this, and even going back and forth with Abraham and allowing him to lead the conversation. This is incredible. God is so merciful, so long-suffering, so compassionate that he didn't go and say, I'm here to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, uh, I don't want to hear anything you have to say, Abraham. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. No, but God in his mercy and compassion here, he, he conversates with Abraham here. He allows Abraham to lead the conversation even to the point that he gets down to 10. And God says, 10, yes. Why did Abraham stop at 10? We'll answer that in a minute. We're now in chapter 19. If you're with me, you can say amen. We're in chapter 19. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When, the, when Lot saw them, he arose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the, the ground, and he said, Here now, my lords, please, turn to your servant's house, and spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you may um, arise early and go your way. And they said, No, we'll, we'll spend the night in the open square. Verse 3. But he insisted, Lot insisted strongly. So they turned to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread. And they what? And they ate. Now, why, why was Lot so nervous here? 
Lot sees them come into the gates, and he's nervous that they're going to spend the night there in the, in the open, open space. Why is Lot so nervous for these two strangers? Because he has seen what had been done to others in that situation. Yes or no? Yes. So Lot here, of course, being a, a godly man, he says, hey, 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 no, no, no. You, you come to my house. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to make you some food. And you spend the night in my safe haven here. Are you with me? Verse 4. Now before they laid down, the men of, of the city... The men of Sodom, look at this, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house and they called to Lot and said to him, where are these men that came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway and shut the door behind him. And said, please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let the, me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men since these, this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. And these, this is, the, these men of Sodom young and old come knocking on the door and says, we want to force ourselves sexually on these men, bring them out and look at this. And, and Lot, Lot says, I have two virgin daughters. Let me bring them out and you can have, do whatever you want with them. Now, you need to listen now carefully, friends. This begins to show us that Sodom began to already have an influence on Lot. Because guess what? I wouldn't give them my daughter. Amen. If I have a five-year-old daughter, if she was old enough to age, whatever they are, these teenagers, and they knocked on my door, I would never say, you can have my daughter. Mm -mm. We begin to see here that Lot was being affected by Sodom here. He's not thinking straight here. Mercy. And the angels step in. Amen. Verse 9. And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came uh, in to stay here and he keeps, okay, sorry, verse nine. And they said, stand back. Then they said, oh, this one came to stay here and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the, the, the man, Lot, and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into his house within, and they shut the door. And they struck the men that were at the doorway with, with the house with blindness, both small and great. So they became weary trying to find the what? The door. They're confused and they're, 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 they're finding the door. What, what kind of place is Sodom here? Is this place become a point where they have completely turned their backs on the will of God? In Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, it says, but the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against whom? Against the Lord. Perversions and pleasure seeking. In other words, this is a society that had sexual freedom. In other words, they practice all sorts of sexual freedom and sleep here and sleep here and sleep whomever you want to sleep with and, and everything is okay. Almost begins to sound like today, that rhyme, by the way. And then... Replacing the natural for the unnatural. Man with man and woman with woman. A complete disregard of God and what he says. Difference, be now listen now. Th th there's a difference between struggling with sin and letting yourself go into sin. Do you hear what I said? There's a difference between struggling with sin 
and you fall and you get up and you say, Lord, forgive me. And you continue on that journey and God is helping us and, and we're stumbling and we're walking. There's a, there's a difference between struggling with sin and letting yourself go all the way into sin and not caring anymore. Can you say amen? amen. Sodom was revealing to the universe their condition and complete disregard to God's love and way. It was under Satan's complete influence and way. And did you know that in the last days, this world will be in the same condition. We don't care what God says and we don't care what his word says. We don't care about God's law. We want to do our thing. We want to be who we want to be, do what we want to do. We will even choose what kind of people we are. It doesn't matter. We're in control. This is today's society. Yes. Did you know the Bible says it will come a time where God's spirit is withdrawn from the world? Why? Because as people reject it and reject it and reject it, in other words, the hearts of people will come to a point where God's spirit can no longer do the work it's here to do. Yes or no? Yes. On page 157 of Patriarchs and Prophets, we're told in Sodom, there was mirth and revelry, feasting and drunkenness. The vilest and most brutal passions were unrestrained. The people openly defied God and his law and delighted in the deeds of violence. Here we are, verse 12, here we go. Say amen if you're there. Then the men said to Lot, have you any one else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Verse 14. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, which had married his daughters, and said, get up. Get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But the sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Now think, I asked the question, why do you think that Lot stopped at 10? Not Lot, but Abraham stopped at 10. I believe that Abraham had his family in mind. And he said, my family that is in Sodom will be enough. Because listen, count. We have Lot. How many is that? Good. We have his wife, two. He had two daughters at home. That gives us what? Now, the Bible says that he had sons-in-law and daughters outside of the home. That is plural. Amen. So at least, he had at least Two sons-in-laws, right? So we're at four, five, six. And then two daughters at least outside the house. That's seven and eight. But could it be that he could have had three daughters outside the house and therefore he would have 10 family members in the city? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Lot stopped at 10 because he said, I think my family, but guess what? Abram was wrong. Because Sodom and Gomorrah had began to infiltrate its, its ways into the heart of Lot and his family. Are you understanding? And the time came. The hour had come for God to deal with what was happening and they were not ready. The time came for God to do what he was set to do, and they who were supposed to be ready were not ready. Is this serious business? Serious business. Now look at this. 
we need to we 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 need to understand this that God had tried to reach Sodom and reveal himself through Abraham earlier in history. When Abraham rescued them from captivity, go to Genesis chapter 14 quickly. Don't, don't lose chapter 19, but go to chapter 14. I want to show you here from the Bible that God had earlier in history tried to appeal to the people of Sodom and the king of Sodom to surrender their life to the God of the universe. We're in chapter 14. Take a look. Say amen if you're there. Look at, verse, look at verse 11. It says in verse 11 of chapter 14. Then they took all the goods of who? Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's, brother and so, uh, Abram's brother's son, and dw who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. This is when Sodom and Gomorrah and others were, were, were ransacked and conquered, and they were taken captive, and Abraham heard about it. And this was years before we come to chapter 19. And now look at verse 16. It says, so he brought back, this is when Abraham went and he brought it all back. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him, Abraham, at the valley of Sheva. That's the king's valley. After his return from the defeat of uh, Kaidralomor and the kings who were with him. And look at this. Look at um, uh, verse 18. And then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and, and, uh, and as was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, because uh, blessed be Abram of God, the Most High, posse uh, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the God Most High, who, will del who delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Verse 21. Now the king of Sodom. The king of who? Sodom. Said to Abram. Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom. Don't you miss it. I have raised my hand to the Lord. God most high. And the possessor of heaven and earth. This was a moment where God was using Abraham to appeal to the king and people of Sodom because God loved them. One amen. We see years earlier that God was doing everything he could to reach the people of Sodom. Now I got no amens. God was doing everything he could to reach the people of Sodom. Amen. Therefore, when we come to chapter 19, their constant rejection of God's appeal, constant rejection of God's mercy towards them, finally here is there, and Lot and his family are unprepared. But you know what? God is always merciful. Can you say amen? Look at this, patriarchs and prophets, this is incredible. When Abraham rescued the captives from the Elamites, the attention of the people was called to the to true faith. Abraham was not a stranger to the people of Sodom, and his worship of the unseen God had been a matter of ridicule among them. But his victory over greatly superior forces and his magnanimous disposition of the prisoners and spoil excited wonder and admiration. While his skill and valor was extolled, none could avoid the conviction that a divine power had made him conqueror. And his noble and unselfish spirit, so foreign to the self-seeking inhabitants of Sodom, was another evidence of the superiority of the religion which he had honored by his courage and fidelity. Look at this. God was speaking to the people by his providence, but the last ray of light was rejected as all before had been. Did you know that in these last days, God has an Abraham who would appeal to the world and be a light to the world and let them understand that God loves them, wants them to repent of their sins and come to him? Did you know that? That God would raise up a movement in these last days to be a light to the world and said, hey, don't forget God. And God wants to see you in eternity. 
And he has paid the price for your sins. All you have to do is surrender yourself and accept that free gift. Do you see that God never changes? Do you see it? He never changes. Now listen carefully. The Bible says that when Lot came to his sons-in-laws, they thought he was what? Do you remember? He was joking. Oh, this guy. Now listen, listen. Lot's sons-in-law looked at him as he was joking. He had never, Lot had never been as urgent before. Lot had never warned them of the wickedness before. Lot didn't seem so worried before, and now they didn't take him seriously. The day and everything was going on as always. Oh, Lot, I mean, you were never so urgent before. Why now? You were never so, um, you know, if this was so bad, why did you stay here so long and live? I mean, you understand that? When Lot came to them and said, hey, we got to get out. God's going to destroy the city. The wickedness has reached the heaven. And they're like, oh, Lot, now you're really serious about it. Hmm. He was never urgent before. And now as the day was going, as it was, as always, they thought this guy was just a big joke. This is a joke. My friends, we claim that Christ is coming and we say Jesus is coming soon and we say amen. And especially as if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, if somebody says Christ is coming soon, you are to say amen by law. Christ is coming soon. Amen. But how are we living? How are we what? How are we living? If we claim Christ is coming soon, and we claim the urgency of his coming, should we not live in accordance, yes or no? We're in chapter 19, just stay with me. You see, the city has revealed that what God is about to do, he is just in doing. They had reached a point in their rebellion and sin that it reached the limit, verse 15, here we are, chapter 19, verse 15. Say amen if you're there. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are there, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord's Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the what? The city. What happened? Outside the what? City. You see, God is doing what he can to save those who want to be saved from his city, from the city. Now, here's my question. Why did Lot linger or hesitate to leave? Look at this. Patriarchs and prophets, take a look. While her body was upon the... Let me make sure I'm here. Okay. Hey, here we go. It says, some of his children clung to Sodom and his wife refused to depart without them. The thought of leaving those whom he had dearest on earth seemed more than he could bear. It was hard to forsake his luxurious home and all the wealth acquired by the labors of his whole life. To go forth a destitute wanderer, stupefied with sorrow, he lingered, loath, and departed. He says, I can't leave my stuff behind. I spent years accumulating all this stuff. You know how long it took me to pay off this car? You know how long it, it took me to pay off this house? I can't leave now and my kids. Do you know that some people will be lost because of their possessions? Because we have a hard time detaching from the things that we spent 
our entire lives trying to get. But don't you dismiss, dare miss my words, friends. Why do we work so hard to obtain things? But when it comes to our spiritual health and our eternity, we like to play Russian roulette. And we don't spend the time with Jesus and time with God in our devotions and our intentional in our walk with God. It doesn't happen overnight. Can you say amen? You need time. You need to be intentional. And Satan does all he can to interrupt that. And you work and work and degrees. Let me tell you something, friends. Some people will be lost with five degrees in their hands. I'm passionate I believe that Jesus is soon to come. Possessions, family, and pride all needs to be surrendered to God. Even Jesus said we have to love him above mother, father, and children. Amen. Amen, amen. Because guess what? If God is not first in my life, I can't be the husband my wife deserves. If God is not first in my life, I can't be the father my children deserve. Can you say amen? We're almost done. We're in verse 17. We're almost to the point where Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Here we go. We're in verse 17. Are you there? So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, escape for your life and do not look behind nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be what? Destroyed. Then Lot said to them, please, no, my lords, indeed, now your servants has found favor in your sight and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown by uh, me by saving me and by my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains lest some evil overtake me and I die. Verse 20, see now, this city is near enough to flee to and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one and my soul shall live? And he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this thing also in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Verse 22, hurry, escape there for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of that city was called Zoar. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Now I wanna stop there. I want you to think, and I don't want us to go to Google and look at pictures that people draw. The Bible says, number one, would the fires fall on Sodom before they reached Zoar? Yes or no? Say no. No, because the Bible says, he said, I will not bring down the fire until you make it to Zoar. Can you say amen? amen. Okay. Then the Bible says, in verse, um, verse 20, yeah, verse 23, and the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. So, therefore, they spent all night running to the other city, yes or no? Because the sun, now think, think, please think. Therefore, Lot's wife did not look back right when she left Sodom because the Bible says that fire would not come down until they made it there and it took them all night to get there. Therefore, Lot's wife spent all night running yet not looking back. Now keep reading. Because most pictures on Google will show Lot's wife in, in the plains and here comes, that is not what the Bible is teaching here. That the if the fire had, had fallen while they were still in the plains, they would have died. Are you understanding this detail? Now keep reading. Here we go. Now we're in verse 24. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire and Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord, from the Lord out of the heavens. 
So he overthrew these cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. Here it is, verse 26. But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And you probably missed it. Now, you husbands with families, if God had called you to run out of Sodom, and you had your wife and kids, would you do this? Would, would you be like, your wife and kids are behind you and you're like, well, hope you make it. Any father and, and husband would do that? If you're any good father or, and husband, your family's gonna be where? Let's go, and you're running, and you're running. And the Bible says again that they ran all night, ran all night, ran all night, and as they came to the city, and as we get there, his daughters, Lot, come, and Lot's wife turns back. And what happens to her? Here's the moment. Here's the moment where Jesus said, do you remember? Easy Bible verse here. Remember Lot's wife. Let's begin to close by dissecting what happened here. Let's go to Luke 17. Luke 17. Are you in Luke 17? Verse 28. We're about done. And Jesus said here in verse 28, now look at it carefully. Likewise, as it was also in the days of of Lot, they ate and they drank and they bought and they sold and they planted and they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is in the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, look at this. And likewise, the one who was in the field let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. What is Jesus saying? Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. Now listen carefully, please. She longed to still be in Sodom. Her heart, her what? Her heart was still there. Because of her possessions, she could not detach herself from her possessions. And her children, she didn't want to leave. She longed to stay in Sodom. She enjoyed her life of sin there. She wasn't appreciative or too worried about her salvation. She was actually disrespecting God and his salvation. She longed, she, she loved her sinful life there. I mean, she didn't want to leave. She couldn't detach herself from the possessions in all the years again of gaining those things. Her children had chosen to not leave and she, she did not want to leave. And that night she kept running and running. Her heart was like, no, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. And finally, she's just like, no. And she was the heart. She had lost sight of her God. As I begin to close, as I said, I'm gonna read something here from Patriarchs and Prophets. It is challenging. But sometimes we have to be challenged. Can you say amen? amen. While her body was upon the plain, her what? Her heart clung to Sodom and she perished with it. She rebelled against God because 
His judgments involved her possessions and her children in the ruin, although so greatly favored in being called out from the wicked city, she did not appreciate God's effort to save her. But don't miss it. Was not God also trying to save the others, yes or no? Yes. Continues. She felt that she was severely dealt with because the wealth that it had taken years to accumulate must be left to destruction. My friends, I pray, please, I plead with you, do not get to a point in your life where you cannot detach yourself from things, please. We're going to study tomorrow morning. When? Tomorrow morning. The verse that says, I go and prepare a place for you. What does Christ mean by that? You're going to want to be here tomorrow morning. And then at four o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to study the signs of the times. It's just things. Let me give you a little. When Jesus comes, you can't tie your car around your waist. There's nothing on this earth that's worth losing eternity for. Continues. Instead of be, instead of what? What's this word? Come on, now speak to me, friends. Instead of thankfully accepting deliverance, she presumptuously looked back to desire the life of those who had rejected the divine warning. What kind of life was it? Her sin showed her to be unworthy of life for the preservation of which she felt so little gratitude. Now, here we go. It can be, this is hard for me here, but I have, to, I have to surrender to God and everything in my life. Now, listen, we should, be, we should be beware of treating lightly God's gracious provision for our salvation. Don't you miss it? God did everything for, he gave his life for you to be saved. There are Christians who say, I do not care to be saved unless my companion and children are saved with me. They feel that heaven would not be heaven to them without the presence of those who are so dear. But have those who cherish this feeling a right conception of their own relation to God in view of his great goodness and mercy toward them? To say, God help us, to say, you know what, Lord? I don't want to be saved if uh, the others are not. What you're doing is you are downplaying the salvation that God has given you personally because we are saved by our personal choices. Can you say amen? amen? Lots and his wife's children chose, chose to remain there. They chose to turn their back on God's mercy. But here's the thing. God appealed to every one of us and to say, oh no, Lord, I don't want to be saved. What you're saying is, Lord, I don't appreciate what you've done for me. Have they forgotten that they are bound by the strongest ties of love and honor and loyalty to the service of their creator and redeemer? The invitations of mercy are addressed to how many? To all. And because our friends reject the Savior's pleading love, shall we also turn away? The redemption of the soul is precious. Christ has paid an infinite price for our salvation. Can you say amen? And no one who appreciates the value of this great sacrifice or the worth of the soul will despise God's offered mercy because others choose to do so. The very fact that others are ignoring his just claims should arouse us to greater diligence that we may honor God ourselves and lead all whom we can influence to accept his love. So woe to God's people who know the truth, the love of God, but yet seek temporal advantages and social influences and put themselves and their family in Satan's territory who enjoy a life and place of sin over righteousness. Lot's wife, daughters, and sons-in-laws died because of their own choice 
But Lot made a bad decision to live in that city. He put his family in a place, listen please, he put his family in a place to prosper in riches and pleasure, but as a result, they lost their love for God and eternity. Did you hear what I said? They were in a place to succeed in riches and in pleasure, and in doing so, they lost their love for God and eternity in the process. His children became lost and he barely made it out. And listen now, also the result we see in the cave of Lot and his daughter. If you know the story, Lot's two daughters and him, Lot, in the cave and they slept with their father. I mean, you can clearly see that Sodom had a, a, a bad impact on his daughters. Don't ever, ever Ever, young people, old people, older people, middle people, don't ever, 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 one more ever, ever, um, um, what's the word? Um, um, I want to get it right. Don't ever, um, oh, Lord, help me. Don't ever see the importance of influence. Influence is serious business. God wants to influence us and Satan wants to influence us. Don't ever underestimate the importance of influence. So here, my last few slides. God is still doing all he can to save those who truly want to be saved. Can you say amen? amen? This world, the times we are living in, is a spitting image of Noah and Lot's day. In 2 Timothy, the Bible says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. This was Sodom and Gomorrah, and this is our day today. No regard for life. Sin, no matter how a base is okay, do whatever you want, think whatever you want, choose who you want to be, whatever you want to do is okay, sleep around, do whatever, do this, it doesn't matter, truth doesn't matter, we live in a world today, friends, it's a joke, but God is calling his people to stand for him, to say, God, no, as for me and my house, we will honor God, because we love God. And why do we love God? Because he first loved me. And he has given his, the ultimate price to save me, his own life. God has brought you here. because he loves you. And way too many of us are, a lot like, are like Lot's wife. We might say that we follow Jesus and we might even come to church once a week, but really, we haven't surrendered everything. We, 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 still, we still like that life of sin. We, we still care more about our stuff. We might spend 40 hours a week working for our temporal things and we might spend five minutes time with Jesus. 
but yet we think we're okay. Until God calls us to run, and then we begin to see that we're not where we thought we were. And therefore, Jesus appeals to his people, remember Lot's wife. I want to give some appeals here because the time is now. First off, did this message make sense today? My first appeal are to those who want to say, Lord, may I examine my life to see really where my priorities are. And God is calling you to sit down if need be and say, Lord, let me be honest with my life here. Am I like Lot's wife? So my first appeal is anybody here tonight must say, Lord, I want to put you first above everything else, my things, my job, even my family. I want to have Jesus as the number one person in my life above everything else. Is there anybody here tonight willing to make that commitment to their God? If yes, stand. If you're serious, serious about that, stand. I hesitate sometimes to say stand because, oh, people are standing. I should too. This, when, you, when there's an appeal given, it's between you and the Lord, no one else. God honors, honors your decision. And you have told God today, I want to put him first. Here's my second appeal, and it's even more specific appeal. I know there are either either a person or people here in God's house tonight that know that they need to give their life to Jesus through baptism. And God has been tugging on your heart to do so, but you have resisted it. And tonight, God is giving you a chance here to say, yes, Lord. I need to be baptized. I need to go down into the waters and say, Lord, I want to publicly confess that I have died to the old and now I have chosen Jesus. Is there anybody here tonight that knows that they need to be baptized? Come. We need to be praying. Appeals are not for the pastor here. The appeals are for all of us. Please do not harden your heart to God's Spirit. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? The time is now. Please, please. Somebody else here that says, Lord, I need to be baptized. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of rebelling. I want to follow your word to what I know and the truth that I know. The time is now. Come forward if that's you. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Please. One more call. Anybody else out there? Anybody else out there knowing God is calling them, calling them to join their sister up here in baptism? The greatest decision you will ever make. God 
God bless you, sister. God bless you. If God keeps touching your heart tonight, I appeal to you to reach out to Pastor Eddie, the elders. That tank has been filled because we know that God's people will make decisions. Father God, thank you so much for being with us. And Lord, I thank you for your people. I thank you for my sister here. I said, Lord, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of rebelling. I, I want to be baptized. I want to die to the old. I want to surrender my life to Jesus, my Savior. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that if there's anybody else here and they're just knowing that God's Spirit is calling them, but they're just hesitant to come, please, Lord, give them courage to say, no, Lord, please, I want to heed your Spirit's calling. There's still time. I thank you for this church. May we remember Lot's wife. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to come together. Thank you for this message, Lord. Please help us to um, take into our hearts how important influence is. Help us to choose your influence and not the world's influence, Lord. Uh, thank you once again for this time together. Thank you for the Sabbath, and uh, thank you for us being out of time to fellowship after this, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.